Well, today we're going to study the book of Revelation, so I want to begin by reading some of it, especially because it says, blessed is the one who reads it, so I want a blessing. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. To the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is, and who was, and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power for ever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, and even those who pierced him, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Well, Revelation is a strange book and it divides Christians into two groups, those you can't get into the book and those you can't get out of it. Do you know what I mean? The fearful and the fanatical. And human opinion has varied enormously about this book. Some think it's a wonderful book, some think it's a terrible book and leave it strictly alone. Among the negative comments, I've made a notes of a few, as many riddles as there are words a farrago of baseless fantasy, a haphazard accumulation of weird symbols, and worst of all, it will either find you mad or leave you mad. Unfortunately, the Protestant reformers three or four hundred years ago had a very low opinion of Revelation, and ever since it's had a, a little place in Protestant churches. Martin Luther was very rude about it. He said it's neither apostolic nor prophetic. He said everyone thinks of the book whatever his spirit finds there. There are many nobler books to be retained. My spirit cannot acquiesce in this book. And he wished it wasn't in the Bible at all. John Calvin was very similar and he omitted it altogether from his New Testament commentary. And the third most famous you may not have heard of him, Ulrich Zwingli in Switzerland. He said, it is not a book of the Bible, so we can resist its testimonies. And alas, from there, the Protestant churches have tended to have a very low view of this book. Certainly it took a long time to get into our New Testament, but thank God it's there. Later I'm going to try and get you to imagine what it would be like if your Bible ended with Jude and didn't end with Revelation. It would be terribly incomplete. Fortunately, there are many people who have very positive opinions about this book who think it's a masterpiece, one of the greatest books in the Bible. And that's my opinion too. In fact, it's my favorite book because my favorite book in the Bible is the last one I've studied. And so today, this is my favorite book in the Bible. But I believe it's a very, very important book for where we are in church history. It's a book that I want the whole church to be studying to prepare us for what lies ahead. Now we know the devil's opinion of this book, he hates it. There are two parts of our Bible which Satan wants to keep out of your reading if he can. The first three chapters and the last three chapters in the whole Bible, the first few pages and the last few pages. Why? Because the first few pages tell us how he got a hold of us, how he got into this world and took it over and is now the prince, the ruler and the god of this world. 
But the last few pages tell us how he's going to be kicked out of this world. His days are numbered. So he hates these two bits of the Bible. And if he can persuade you that Genesis is myth and Revelation is mystery, he's happy. Over the last 20 years or so, we have had many tapes of Revelation 20 ruined between leaving anchor in perfect condition and reaching the people they were sent to. And it's usually seven minutes on that Revelation 20 tape that's been ruined. And during those seven minutes, I talk about Satan's doom. So he's not very happy with you being here today. What does God think of this book of Revelation? Well, we know his opinion. He has a very high opinion of this book. It's the only one in the whole Bible that has a blessing at the beginning attached to those who read it and a curse at the end on those who tamper with it. The curse at the end says that if you ever take anything out of this book or add anything of your own into this book, that you will suffer the plagues described herein and you will lose your salvation, your place in the city of God. Now these are serious things. There's a great blessing attached to those who read this book aloud and those who hear it read and take it to heart. And then there's this curse at the end about not tampering with it. Now that's unusual. It's the only book in the Bible that has such a blessing and a curse attached to it. Now let's just see its place in the whole Bible. It is the final book. It's the end of the story. Now the Bible can be looked at from two points of view. It is a history book through and through, unlike most of the other sacred scriptures of other religions, which are not history. Our Bible is history, but unlike any other history book you can get in the library, it starts earlier and it finishes later. It starts at the beginning of our universe and goes right through to the end of it. No other history book that you can read covers such a span. And without the book of Revelation, we would not know how history is going to end. Your guess would be as good as mine as to how the world will end, but we know. We are the only people who do know how this history of ours is going to end, how the world will end. And it's because we have this last book. It completes the entire history of our universe. Another way of looking at the Bible is to see it as a romance. It's full of romance, very romantic book. It's the story of a father looking for a bride for his son. And if we didn't have the book of Revelation, we wouldn't have the account of the marriage. We'd finish with the engagement between the son and his bride. Paul, writing to one of his churches, says, I have betrothed you to Christ. And that is the present relationship of a Christian to Jesus. We are engaged to him. We are betrothed. We're not married. The marriage comes at the end. And like every good romance, the Bible finishes with, and they got married and lived happily ever after. There was a lovely misprint at the end of a romantic novel which said, and they got married and lived happily even after. But <laughs> the normal ending is, and they get married and live happily ever after. And that's how the Bible ends. It ends with the marriage. You see, if we didn't have revelation, it might end with a broken engagement. But it ends with the marriage supper of the Lamb, ends with a wedding, and they go to live happily in the New Jerusalem forever and ever. So without this book, the Bible would be very much shortened and cut off and the story wouldn't end, whether it were history or romance. So we're glad we've got it. Now, I'm afraid many Christians are frightened by this book. They've tried to read it and they get well through the first few chapters to about chapter 5. And then with chapter 6, they find themselves out of their depth and they're wondering what it's all about and where it's all going. And a few pages further on, they're giving up. It is, at first sight, a very complicated book, a very difficult book, an obscure book. But I believe that's because we've forgotten two important facts. Fact number one, this book was written for ordinary people. It wasn't written for theological professors. 
In fact, I got a lovely quote here. It is one of the misfortunes of our expertise-oriented culture that when anything seems difficult, it's sent off to the university to be figured out. But uh, that's what's happened to this. And here's another quote I found which puts it in a devastating way. We boldly affirm that the study of this book would present absolutely no possibility of error if the inconceivable, often ridiculous prejudice of theologians in all ages had not so trammeled it and made it bristle with difficulties that most readers shrink from it in alarm. Apart from these preconceptions, the revelation would be the most simple, most transparent book that prophet ever penned. That's quite a statement. It is basically a simple book written for simple people. For the members of seven churches in what is now Western Turkey, and they were very ordinary people, not highly educated, not very noble, just very ordinary people, many of them slaves. And this book was written for them and would make sense to them. I heard a lovely story from America. It could be a preacher's story. Do you know what I mean by that? Little boy asked his father once, Daddy, was that story true or was you just preaching? <laughs> well, there are these apocryphal stories which preachers love to retail, and this may be one of them, but it's the story of a group of theological students in a seminary, I nearly said cemetery, a theological seminary in America. And they were having lectures on the apocalyptic literature of the Bible, including Revelation. And they were left in total confusion by the professor. So they decided to have a game of basketball in the campus gymnasium. And while they were playing basketball, they noticed the janitor or caretaker sitting at the side of the gymnasium, a black man. He was waiting with the keys to lock up when they'd finished. And they noticed he was reading his Bible. So after they'd played the game, they went to him and said, good to see you reading the Bible. Oh, I love my Bible. What part of it are you reading? Revelation. You don't understand that, do you? Of course I do. Well, what's the message in it? Simple. Jesus wins. <laughs> Which is an excellent summary of the whole book of Revelation. Now, there's a bit more to say than that. It's not quite as simple as that, and we're going to take all day to say a good deal more. But that's the essence of it. That simple man had got the real message. Jesus wins. I love that uh, verse that says the common people heard Jesus gladly. That's not just a tribute to Jesus, it's a tribute to common people. Because you can't fool common people. You can fool educated people very easily. Just dress it up in the right philosophical language. But common people can't be fooled. They just say the emperor has no clothes. And they just say it like it is. And this is written for common people. And therefore, we need to read it with common sense. That's one of the greatest helps in understanding the simple, straightforward message of Revelation. Use your common sense. Take a statement at its face value. Don't be thrown by the symbols. No one takes the whole book literally. No one takes the whole book metaphorically or symbolically. It is a mixture of the literal and the symbolical. How do we know when we're dealing with this? How do we know when we're dealing with that? Well, when you see a scarlet woman sitting on a dragon, your common sense says that's not literal, that's a picture. At other times, your common sense says that's literal. Use your common sense. Also, use the rules of common speech. And one of the rules in common speech is that the same word in the same context has the same meaning. Now that sounds obvious, doesn't it? But I can tell you now, when we come to Revelation 20, there would never have been the whole discussion about whether you're amillennial, premillennial or postmillennial if people had used that simple rule, the same word in the same context has the same meaning. So much can hang on simple rules of common speech. Well, it was written for ordinary people like ourselves. However, it was written for ordinary people a long time ago and a long way away.
about 2,000 years ago and nearly 2,000 miles away. And therefore we do have to try and get back into their minds and their hearts and read it through their eyes. So it does involve a little bit of exercise to see what would those seven congregations make of all this book. And then we can start applying it to today. Now that's the first important principle. It was written for ordinary people. The second principle that opens this book to us is that it was written for a practical purpose, a very practical purpose. I want to say very strongly that it was not written to satisfy your curiosity about the future. And if you treat the book like that, you are mistreating it. It was not given to make us uh, what are called illuminati in history, those who have secret knowledge, those who've been initiated into the secrets of the future. It was not given to us to make us superior in that way. Nor was it given to us so that we can write it all down on a large chart or timetable and then work out what time it is on God's clock and how near we are to the end. There's an awful lot of that been done with Revelation. And it has therefore had no practical effect whatever on the lives of those who studied it. Just to be in the know about the future may satisfy your curiosity, but that's not why it was written. It was written for a practical, not an intellectual purpose. It was written not just for your mind, but for your will and for your heart. And we'll come to that practical purpose in a moment. It's not an old Moore's almanac with a detailed forecast. True, the book is filled with predictions about the future. There are altogether 56 separate predictions about the future here in this book, some of them repeated more than once. Furthermore, that's the highest percentage of predictions in any book in the New Testament, not in the whole Bible. Daniel has a few more and Ezekiel has a few more, but in the New Testament, there are more predictions about the future in this book than any other book in the New Testament. So it is about the future, but not to satisfy your curiosity. The Lord has only told us what we need to know about the future in order to be ready for it. Now that's the practical purpose. The reason he's told you what's coming is so that you can get ready and be prepared, to use the Boy Scouts motto. Be prepared, get ready now. In other words, all that the New Testament says about the future is to help us to live right in the present. And therefore many of our questions about the future are not answered in the Bible. All sorts of details, I'm sure some of you will want to ask me questions after today and with a lot of them I'll have to say, I don't know, we're not told. What we're not told, we don't need to know now. What we are told is what we do need to know if we're to live right now. That's why Jesus said, I've told you all these things that are going to happen so that you won't be deceived now, so that you can live right now. So that's the practical purpose. All the predictions about the future are given to influence the present. And that is because we live by three virtues, faith, hope, and love. Now abideth faith, hope, and love, but the weakest of these is hope. That's my own translation. And in the modern church, I find that hope is almost non-existent because hope is what we know is going to happen in the future. It's not really a good English word, uh, hope, because it's an uncertain word. I hope it's going to be fine tomorrow. I hope I pass my exam. There's an uncertainty. Whereas in the Greek word, elpis, which is translated hope, that means something of which you are absolutely sure is going to happen. And that's a very strong word. And that's why it says hope is like an anchor to your soul. What we know is going to happen holds us when the storm comes. And the very centre of that hope in the future is the fact Jesus is coming back to planet Earth. And the whole book of Revelation is built around that fact. It begins and ends with notice of his coming. 
his second coming, his return to planet earth, and that holds you like an anchor when the storm hits you. Jesus is coming back. That's the very centre of our hope for the future. I have no hope in any politician. Yet every election is beginning to be messianic. Have you noticed? Every election is looking for a political messiah who can put everything right and get us out of our troubles. And each time somebody wins, we think we've found him. Six months later, we're beginning to get a little disappointed and a few years later, we're disillusioned. That's because there's only one messiah. There'll be many false ones who claim to be, but there's only one coming back to put it all right. And one day Jesus will be back among us and he'll put it right. And among other things, he's going to kick the devil out. And until that happens, we're going to have trouble the whole way because we can't get rid of the devil, but he can. Well, now I'm jumping ahead right to the end, aren't I? Well, now the particular practical purpose for which this book is written may be found in one verse right in the middle of the book in chapter 14, and it's verse 12. And to me, that one verse right in the middle of the book opens up the whole book. Let me read it. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. This calls for endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. This book of Revelation at the end of the Bible is written specifically for suffering saints. And this may be why we have such problems with it, because we're not suffering. But Christians in many, many parts of the world are suffering and dying for Jesus. And for them, the book of Revelation is as plain as day. You almost need to be a suffering saint to understand this book, and we're not. So we treat it as an intellectual or academic challenge. Instead of seeking to feed ourselves on it, so that we can suffer and endure. And this is written by a man who is already suffering for his Lord. It's written by John on the island of Patmos, a little island eight miles long, about 60 miles as the crow flies from the city of Ephesus, and he's a political prisoner. He has to work in the quarry on that little island. And there he is. I've got a picture of it, I think, here. Let's, let's just look at the... Uh, right on the top of the highest hill of the island, there is now a monastery, the Monastery of St. John. There it is. It looks more like a castle than a monastery. But that's on the site of the prison near the quarry where they had to chip out granite from the quarry and they slept in cells here. And John is there. What crime has he committed? He says, I'm here for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. He is a traitor to the Roman Empire. And so he's been banished to what was then the equivalent of Robin's Island or Alcatraz. And there he is in prison. He is suffering for Jesus. So the book was born out of a man suffering for Jesus. But he's writing to saints who are also going to suffer and he's preparing them for that. And that is why I believe this book is so important because Christians are going to be less and less popular. They are going to suffer more and more as we get nearer to the end of this age. And this book was written to prepare us before the suffering hits us so that we are ready for it and able to endure it when it happens. Now John was writing this book in that prison in Patmos on the Lord's Day, the Lord's Day, not a Lord's Day. And we tend to make the mistake of thinking that was Sunday and that he must have been missing going to one of the seven churches that he used to visit and preach in. But that's not quite the case. I must give you a bit of history now. 25 years before Jesus was born, there was a Roman emperor called Julius Caesar, of whom I'm sure you've heard. 
he actually invaded these shores. And Julius Caesar was the first emperor to call himself divine. Not just human, but divine. He was followed by Augustus and Tiberius, and Augustus went one further, and he commanded worship. And he said, I want you to erect temples to me all over the empire. And so Augustan temples were raised, and in them people worshipped Augustus as God. And particularly in western Turkey, the cult of the Roman Empire took deep roots and many temples were built to the Roman emperors. But Revelation was written much later, around the year 96 AD, towards the end of the first century. And by that time, Christians had begun to suffer. They'd begun to suffer in Rome itself under Nero, and Nero did horrible things. If you ever go to Rome, stand with your back to the Colosseum and look at a green hill on the opposite side of the road. That was Emperor Nero's garden. That's where he held garden parties by night, and he tied Christians to posts and had them covered with pitch and set a light alive to illuminate his barbecues. That's where he used to order Christians to be sewn into the skin of wild animals, and then wild dogs were let loose on them in an enclosure. That was how Nero amused himself. But that persecution didn't spread beyond Rome. About 30 years later, Domitian became the Roman emperor, and he really started the suffering of Christians right through the empire. You see, he called himself two new titles. He said, you must call me Lord and God. Lord and God. That's exactly what Thomas had once said to a carpenter from Nazareth. My Lord and my God. Well, Domitian said something more. He said, once a year, everybody must worship me. They must stand in front of a bust of me and an altar with a fire on it, and they must take a pinch of incense and burn it on the altar and raise their hand and say three words, Caesar is Lord. Once a year, he expected everybody in the empire to do this at the cost of their life if they refused. Now, Christians were presented with a horrible alternative. Only three words, Caesar is Lord, but Jesus is Lord was the earliest creed of the church, and they would never give that title to anyone else. God had highly exalted Jesus and given him the name Lord, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and we should call him Lord. And so they were going to refuse, or at least they would now be given the most acid test of their loyalty to Jesus they'd ever had. Would they say those three words? After all, they're just three words. Now the day on which Domitian commanded that to be done throughout the empire, he gave a special name to the day, the Lordy Day. And that's the exact phrase in the Greek in Revelation 1. It is the Lordy Day, and Lord is an adjective and not a noun. I was in the Spirit, says John, on the Lordy Day. Not on a Lord's Day, but the Lordy Day. Sunday is always called the first day of the week in Scripture. But the Lordy Day, that's special. It was an annual day when the Emperor said, you all say Caesar is Lord. And John in his prison could see that this was going to be the greatest test of the people in those seven churches that he had pastored and taught in. Would they give in? Would they go under? And so he wrote the book, and it's called, This is a Call to the Saints to Endure. But not just to endure, that means to endure under something. He used another word, which is actually the key word for the whole book, and it goes all the way through. It is the word overcome. Endure is to be under something. To overcome it is to get on top of it. Jesus said, Cheer up, in the world you'll have big trouble, but cheer up, I have overcome the world. I'm on top of it. When I asked a friend of mine, how are you? He said, I'm very well on, over the circumstances, which is a neat Christian answer. And so this book is a call to be 
overcomers, not just endure under this pressure, but get on top of it, come out victorious, be, as we sang earlier, more than conquerors, to be on top of the situation and not under it. To that end, the book offers two kinds of incentive, both positive and negative. The positive incentive is offered all the way through in terms of rewards for he who overcomes. Those who come out on top will get one reward after another. And here are just some of them, I'll list them. The right to eat from the tree of life in the paradise of God. The right not to be hurt at all by the second death. The right to have the hidden manor and the white stone with a secret new name on it. The authority over the nations to rule them. To be dressed in white, to be made a pillar in the temple of God, never to go out again and the right to sit with Jesus on his throne. All these are positive rewards offered to believers who overcome when they're under pressure, who get on top of it and come out victorious. At one point, Jesus says in this book, he who overcomes as I overcome, as I overcame and sit on the throne of my Father, he who overcomes will sit on my throne with me. In other words, Jesus doesn't ask us to do anything he hasn't done himself first. The negative side is what a believer can lose if he doesn't overcome but goes under when the test comes. And this is the most serious note sounded all the way through that book. It comes in chapter 3 verse 5 where Jesus says this, He who overcomes, I will never blot out his name from the book of life. Literally the verb is never scrape off his name. They used a pen knife to scrape ink off parchment to erase a name. And Jesus said, he who overcomes, I will never erase his name from the book of life. What does that mean in simple common sense English for those who don't overcome? Quite simply it means their name can be rubbed out, scraped off the book of life. In fact, the book of life is only mentioned in five books of the whole Bible, but all but one of those talk about names being rubbed out of the book of life. Right at the end of Revelation, remembering that this is a book written for saints, not sinners, it's not written for unbelievers, it's written to seven churches, to believers, at the end of the book comes this extraordinary verse after describing the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. It says this, he who overcomes will inherit all this, but the cowardly and the faithless and the immoral and the deceitful, their lot will be in the lake of fire which is the second death. Now that's not written to sinners, it's not written to unbelievers, it's written to believers. And it ties in with Paul's and Jesus' teaching elsewhere. Here's Paul's teaching. If we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. But if we disown him, he also will disown us. And that's a quote almost direct from Jesus himself who said, whoever disowns me before men I will disown him before my Father in heaven. Now this of course raises the question, once saved, always saved, a cliché which never appears in Scripture, though some believe it stands for what appears in Scripture. However, may I just recommend you to read my little book, Once Saved, Always Saved? Question mark, in which I point out that of all the warnings about hell that Jesus gave, all but two of them were given to born-again believers and those two were given to Pharisees. Jesus didn't talk about hell to sinners, he did talk about hell a lot to his own disciples who had already left all to follow him. And Revelation therefore is written for this very simple purpose to keep Christians' names in the book of life so that they do finish up in the heavenly city and the new heaven and the new earth. That's the very simple uh, reason for which it's written, a very practical reason. 
it holds before us, this book, two eternal destinies which are held in the front of the believers, of the saints, of the members of those seven churches in Asia. One destiny is to be resurrected and reign with Christ and share in the whole new universe. The other destiny is to lose our inheritance in the kingdom and finish up in everlasting torment. And I fear lest having preached to others I be cast away myself. I fear hell. That's why I can talk about it. I could never say, blow you Jack, I'm all right. You're a sinner going to hell and I'm a saint going to heaven. No, this book reminds us that when Jesus comes, he's not looking for those who profess faith, but for those who've kept faith, to whom he can say, well done, good and faithful servant. It's the faith we finish with, not the faith we start with, that ensures our place in heaven. And that's the practical purpose of the book, not just to unveil the future so that you know what's coming, but so that you can be ready for it. And just to give one little example, this book tells us that things are going to get much worse before they get better, that there's going to be big trouble at the end, great tribulation. But one of the comforting things in that book is this, that that great trouble, the big trouble, the worst of all, will only last three and a half years, 42 months or 1,260 days. The Lord couldn't have made it more clear. But the contrast with that is reigning with Christ on this earth for a thousand years. The whole book is saying, don't throw away that for this. When you're under pressure, when it gets really bad, when the going gets really tough, hold on to the future and all you've got to look forward to and don't risk losing that, but remain faithful to Jesus. This is a call for endurance on the part of the saints who keep God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. That's why we read the book. Revelation is not only different in content from all other books in the Bible, it's different in origin. It was the only book that no one decided to write. The Gospels and the Epistles and the Book of Acts, somebody said, I want to write a letter or I want to write a Gospel and sat down and thought it through and then put it on paper. Now I know we say that John wrote it. What do we mean by that? Well, he actually wrote it down but it didn't come from him at all. That explains something that has puzzled the Bible scholars a lot. He calls himself John with no other introduction at all, so he must have been a very well-known and very famous John. And the only well-known John in that area was the Apostle John, the only one of the twelve disciples not to be assassinated, the only one to live to an old age. And we know that he moved to Ephesus and that he took with him Mary, the mother of Jesus, and looked after her as if she were his own mother in Ephesus. And about a year ago, some of us stood at the grave of the Apostle John in Ephesus. Well, now, we say he wrote it, but he didn't really. He never intended to write this book, had no idea of writing it. He was told simply to write down what he saw and heard. He was like a shorthand typist. He was a secretary, or they used to call him in those days a menuensis. Now the problem is that the style of Revelation is so different 
from his gospel and his three letters that many scholars have said it can't be the same John. But I want you to imagine that you're in a cinema watching a film like Gone with the Wind and you're told to write down everything you see and hear in the cinema. Can you imagine what your writing would be like? I know what your notes, those of you are taking notes. Is every sentence complete? Is the grammar good? Is the spelling all right? No. And poor John was having to write down. In fact, he was so overwhelmed with the visions he was seeing and the words he was hearing that many times he forgot to write it down. And 11 times in the book, an angel says, you're not writing this down. Write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. And poor John grabs his pen again and has to keep going. So it's very scrappy. The grammar is bad. Some sentences aren't even complete. And they say, how could the Apostle John, who was a pretty good writer in his old age, how could he have penned such a thing? Well, the answer was he was taking notes, writing down everything he saw and as quickly as possible. Well, then why didn't he take the notes and polish them and produce a nicely written book? Well, the answer is very simple. The last thing he wrote down was, anyone who tampers with this book will be cursed. <laughs> anyone who takes away what you've written... <laughs> or add something to it, so he didn't dare touch what he'd written, and that's why we have, and it is in the Greek, a very scrappy sort of book, and not at all like the Apostle John's writings. But it was his hand that actually wrote down. Nevertheless, it was not from his mind. It was di largely dictated to him. Now, it's amazing how many people were involved in the production of this book. Angels were involved. Angels were telling uh, John what to write. The Holy Spirit was involved. Jesus was involved. It's called the revelation of Jesus, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. So we've got God giving the revelation to Jesus, giving it to his spirit, giving it to angels, giving it to John, giving it to the seven churches. That's the kind of chain of revelation that is involved in this book. It does make it quite unique. We've got a revelation direct from God and direct from Jesus and direct from the Spirit through the angels to John to the seven churches. That's quite a, a long chain. So who is really the author? Well, I suppose God is and Jesus is and the Spirit is. John was simply writing down what he saw and heard and it came in the form both verbal and visual. He heard things and he saw things and was told to write them all down. And that's how we've got it. Now, it begins with an extraordinary revelation of Jesus himself. Bear in mind that John had been the closest to Jesus during his life. When they lay at table, they didn't sit on chairs, they lay in their table like this, and uh, ate with the right hand, they were leaning against somebody else. Incidentally, their dirty feet were under the nose of the next man. That's why they had to wash their feet rather than their hands before they ate. But here's John, always on Jesus' right hand, always leaning on Jesus' breast, whispering things to him. John was the beloved apostle. Uh, I don't like to use the word favorite, but he was closest to Jesus, loved very deeply. And now, 60 years later, he meets Jesus again, but this time he's terrified and falls on the ground in a faint because he has never seen Jesus like this before. For one thing, his hair is now pure white. And that's a change, Jesus. But more than that, it, it is the blazing glory of the figure he sees. He hears him first, a voice behind him speaks, and turning to see who's talking, he has this incredible vision of Jesus. If ever you go to Coventry Cathedral, you'll see a very unusual tapestry at uh, the far end. I'm not sure that I like it. It's enormous. That little man at the feet of Jesus is life-size, and if you've been, you know how big it is. But it was an attempt to portray this glorified, ascended Jesus as he appeared to John. And there are other symbols from the book of Revelation, the creatures from Revelation uh, 4 around the ascended Christ. Christ in glory. 
You see, Paul saw Jesus after he ascended and got his glory back and it blinded him. Whereas in the resurrection appearances, nobody was blinded. When Jesus got his glory back and was blazing with glory, then it, it's quite an awesome sight. And John, who'd known him best of all, couldn't cope with it and fell on the floor in a dead faint. Well, now this is a different Jesus to the Jesus of the gospel. It's the same person, but now he is the ascended, glorified Lord. And that makes him very different. Furthermore, he appears in the robes of a Roman judge. And something always uh, turns your heart upside down when you see a judge in his robes in our country with a wig and full regalia. Uh, a rather awesome figure. You see, when Jesus comes back, he comes as judge. And when the world sees Jesus, they will see a very different Jesus to the one they've seen in stained glass windows and Sunday school pictures. The gentle Jesus, meek and mild, that's taught in Sunday schools is not the Jesus of Revelation. We'll say more about this later. But this is a revelation of Jesus. We see Jesus in a totally new light, a fearsome light. In fact, in chapter 6 it says that the people of the earth, the kings, right down to the slaves, will pray that the mountains will fall on them and swallow them up rather than look on the face of this Jesus and his blazing eyes, blazing with anger at what we've done to his father's world. So we need the book of Revelation to fill out our picture of Jesus and there are many, many brand new titles of Jesus in this book. Some titles even which are given to God in this book are later given to Jesus like Alpha and Omega. And here we have Jesus presenting himself in a new light. As you probably know, he has 250 different names and titles, more than anybody in history, and it's a good devotional exercise to write them down. You'll get stuck about 35, but there are 250 titles of Jesus. Many of them come out of this book. He shows himself in a new revelation of himself and each title shows us something more about him. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and behold I am alive forevermore and I hold the keys of death and Hades. I am holy and true. I am the Amen. I am the faithful and true witness. I am the ruler of God's creation. I am the Lion of the tribe of Judah. I am the Root of David. I am faithful and true. I am the Root and Offspring of David. I am the bright morning star. I love that one. If ever you're up early enough to see the last star before they all disappear, it's low down near the horizon and it's very bright and it's the last one still to be shining. And I just love to say to myself, when all the film stars have gone and when all the pop stars have gone, there'll be one star still shining. That's the meaning of that lovely title, The Bright Morning Star. But above all, there is one title in this book, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I add President of Presidents and Prime Minister of Prime Ministers, because that's what it means. He's the ruler of all rulers. He's Tony Blair's ruler. He's the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. So the book begins with this awesome picture of Jesus, but it also begins with a picture of Jesus in very close contact with the churches on earth, walking among them, walking around them, having a good look at them holding the lampstands in his hand. And here we have the first few symbols in the book, stars, seven stars, seven lampstands. But there's no problem, they're all explained. The lampstands are the churches and the stars are the angels of those churches. Just as every child has an angel reporting back to father what lies are told to children. Jesus said it be better for you not to have a millstone round your neck and be thrown into the sea than tell a lie to a little one because their angels behold the face of my Father in heaven. But each church has an angel looking after it too. And uh, that comes out clearly here. We need to remember that. One day you'll meet the angel of your church. And uh, whenever we worship, we're surrounded by angels. 
When anybody asks me, you know, how many were at church Sunday morning, I want to say thousands. Thousands upon thousands. We just joined in with the heavenly worship. So we have this picture of Jesus, the heavenly ascended Jesus in glory, yet visiting his churches, looking at them, looking at the cities in which those churches are. He reveals a knowledge of both the church and the cities, which is highly unusual. Well, now we've come to the section of seven letters to seven churches. I'm amazed that we pay so much attention to the letters of Paul and so much attention to the letters of John and so little attention to the letters of Jesus. Does that strike you? These are the only letters we have of Jesus himself and we should pay, I think, even more attention to them because they are from him to these seven churches. But we've got to ask, why did Jesus write these letters to those churches? What's so special about them? Well, we'll have to do a little geography first. Let's look at um, a photograph of Turkey taken from a satellite out in space. And here is Turkey, here's Greece. And we notice that Turkey is most of it quite brown and uh, somewhat barren. But right along the north coast, next to the Black Sea, is green. And then there's an exception to that twofold colour. Down in the bottom left hand corner, the southwest corner, there is a green circle. And it's formed by a number of rivers running direct from these hills out to the Aegean Sea and bringing fertility to the valleys. So can you see that, those of you near enough? A green circle down in the bottom corner. All the seven churches are within that circle. It's a very important circle. It's a meeting place between the Western world centered in Rome and the Eastern world of China, Africa, India. It's a melting pot of culture, of Roman culture, of Greek culture, of pagan culture. It's a melting pot of politics. It's a melting pot of religion. It is an extraordinary little area. And there is one further thing that shows how important it is to Jesus. Here is the circle of the churches and uh, the letters are in order. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea. Here's the main road from the west to the east of our world but it splits at Pergamum. One goes down the coast through Ephesus and one goes inland through Thyatira and so on. They meet up again at Laodicea and carry on to the east. This little circle, this fertile circle, is where everything met. Furthermore, and this is the most important revelation in the book, Satan, being a creature rather than a creator, can only be in one place at once. He goes to and fro in the earth, but he also has a headquarters, a residence somewhere in the world. I don't know where it is today. I could guess, but I don't know. But he has a residence from which he makes journeys around the world. He can also have access to heaven too, and he goes up there as well. But he has a residence on earth, which is the center of his kingdom, the capital. And in this time, at the end of the first century, his residence was in Pergamum. That's where Satan lived on the earth and resided. And when Jesus wrote to the church at Pergamum, he says, I know where you live, where Satan resides. The word resides means a permanent residence, where he stays, where he dwells. Now, Satan clearly saw this area, this circle of cities at the meeting point of West and East. He saw this circle as crucial to his kingdom. And uh, when some of us went round this area, we saw the remains of the culture, incredible culture, and the religion, the temples. This is a key area. And there were little churches in each of these seven places, a kind of circuit of churches based on Ephesus. And indeed from Ephesus, most of the others had been planted where John was. 
And Ephesus, we know more about that church than any other in the whole New Testament. And look at the ministries it had. It started off with Apollos, then a um, couple. Priscilla and Aquila. Then it had Paul. Then Timothy. And then John. Few areas had had as many apostles or ministries as this little area. Here was the battleground. It is the end of the first century. The churches are now into their second and third generation. And they are now being planted right in the heart of Satan's kingdom and worldly culture and pagan religion. It is the crucial test. If the churches survive here, they will survive anywhere. If second and third generation Christians can overcome with the pressures here, then the church will go on right to the end. So Jesus is watching this little circle of churches very closely. So much hangs on it. Have I conveyed the, to you the very focus? And Satan has his residence here. The interesting thing is that the condition of the churches is almost in direct ratio to the distance from Satan's residence. Two nearest to Satan are corrupted from the inside with idolatry and immorality. The next two further out are persecuted but are coming out on top and Jesus has no criticism for them. The two furthest away, namely Ephesus and Laodicea, are not troubled by Satan at all. They're just losing their first love or growing cold. Isn't that interesting? Satan is right inside the churches near at hand and he's got idolatry and immorality right inside those churches. A bit further away, he is persecuting them through Jews and they're having a tough time but Jesus has no criticism for the two persecuted churches. But the two furthest away from Satan, they're just growing cold. They're lukewarm, they're neither hot nor cold, or they're losing their first love. It's an amazing picture that emerges from these seven letters. But I think you can see how crucial this area is to the future of the church in the second and third generation, because second and third generation Christians are not always as enthusiastic or as dedicated as the first generation converts. We all know this with our children. They've got to come to the same enthusiasm and zeal for the Lord as their parents have. So second, third generation Christians, churches, tiny little groups of people meeting in houses and halls under this dreadful domination of Greco-Roman culture pagan religion and above all Satan. If you go to Pergamum, there's a huge steep mountain towering over Pergamum itself and on the top of the mountain are libraries and temples and one of them in particular was the Temple of Zeus and it's like a huge armchair, massive U-shaped temple and in the courtyard was an altar which was constantly burning black smoke. You could see from the city of Pergamum right above you this horrible temple with the black smoke constantly rising from it, which uh, Jesus calls Satan's throne. And there's a picture of it, but it's not in Pergamum now. I, that picture is from East Berlin, uh, a museum called the Pergamon. And in fact, this was taken, the altar of Zeus, taken from Pergamum and re-erected in Berlin and you can see it there. It is massive. That little black dot there is a full-size human being. And uh, this massive armchair like that, can you see it? That's Satan's throne. Turkey wants it back and there are Christians in Berlin praying that it may go back. But um, it is not Satan's throne now, it's an empty chair. But that was in Pergamum here and uh, Satan resided right there. And you can, he loves heights, does Satan. He loves to be on top of a mountain surveying the kingdoms of the world. He was when he tempted Jesus in that way. So you can see that this is why Jesus wrote these letters to this particular place. 
I'm not going to say an awful lot about the letters because I've said an awful lot on a double video. Here's the commercial coming. But uh, last year we went out with the uh, film crew that we've got here today and we went out and we went round the seven churches and uh, the, this double video has all the letters translated and explained and expounded in full detail. So I'm not going to go through an awful lot of detail in this series, but let's just look at each letter. There are seven letters to seven churches and almost everything in the book of Revelation is in sevens, right the way through. Seven trumpets, seven seals, seven bowls of wrath. Seven is God's perfect number. It's the round, complete number. What falls short of God is six. And six, six, six is a trinity of falling short of, of God. And we'll come across that figure later. But seven is God's complete and perfect number. And so Jesus speaks to these seven churches, he writes seven letters, and each letter has seven parts. And uh, the seven parts of each letter are so similar, and we'll just run through them. The first part, he puts the address at the top of the letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus, to the angel of the church in Sardis or wherever. Then he never uses his own name. He doesn't say this letter's from Jesus. He gives himself a title, a title that is usually brand new, something that the churches need to know about him. Either they've forgotten some aspect of his personality or they need to be told about it. So when he is pretty scathing about a church, he says, I am the true and faithful witness. I'm telling you the truth. So. The attribute of Jesus is the second item in each letter. These are the words of him who. And then he describes himself. And these descriptions are taken from the initial vision in chapter 1. So having shown himself in glory to John, he now picks things out of that vision and applies them to each church individually. The third item in each letter is he approves something in the church. And here's a neat little uh, reminder to us. If you're going to criticize someone, say something nice first. If you're going to say something bad, say something good first. In fact, all the epistles of the New Testament follow this pattern. Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, which was in a mess, says, I thank God that you come behind in no spiritual gift. There was only one church that Paul couldn't say anything good about. Do you know which one that was? Galatians. But normally when he's writing a letter, he commends them, he approves first. And Jesus does the same. And Jesus always begins this section by saying, I know. I know all about you. I know all the good things you are, all the good things you've done. I know. You need never worry that something you do that's good is not noticed. Jesus sees it if nobody else does. If you never get thanked by the church, don't worry. Because Jesus saw it. He says, I know your deeds, and there's approval. Then he gets on to accusation. But, but, yet I hold this against you. And those criticisms are devastating. Jesus sees all the bad things in your church, the secret, the hidden things, as well as the good things that usually are out in the public eye. But he sees the bad things. Then he moves to advice. And he tells them what he, they should do to put the situation right. But he says, if you don't, I will come and put it right. And to two of the churches, he warns them that Jesus is in the business of closing churches down. Or in the language of Revelation, removing their lampstand. Now, we're so keen to plant new churches, to grow new churches, to open them. But Jesus wants some closed. And he says, either you put this right or I'll have to close you down. And there are plenty of empty church buildings around the world that have been closed down. Jesus not only plants churches, he closes them when they're an insult to him and the gospel. But he always makes an appeal. And the appeal is, he who has an ear, let him hear. Or if I may translate that, let everyone who hears heed what I write. 
There's a difference between hearing and heeding, isn't there? A difference between just hearing the words and taking it in. There was a secretary in London appeared in the office with new earrings and one said in and the other said out. I've often thought of selling them on these evangelical trinket stands <laughs> to congregations. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And you notice that each letter had to be read in all the churches. So they all heard them all. And it must have been uh, quite awesome when you heard the letter to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum, and then yours was next. And you thought, what's he going to say about us? And you waited with bated breath. But the appeal is really saying RSVP. I want a, re a response. I want to reply to this letter. I want to see that you got it by how you react to it. And then an assurance, a promise, closes the letter, to him who overcomes, I will. Now notice that that assurance at the end is not given to the church, it's given to an individual within the church. Whatever the state of your church, however bad it is, you are responsible for you. You can't take responsibility for the whole church. Jesus is saying, whatever the state of your church, what I will ask you in the last days, did you overcome? It also tells us that the first place we have to overcome is inside the church, not outside. That if we can't overcome the problems inside the church, we're never going to be overcomers when the world gets at us. That's the acid test of our endurance and of our overcoming. Interesting, not one of the letters says, I advise you to go down the road to Izmir, because of Smyrna as it was then, I advise you to get your chariot out and go down the road to Smyrna. It's a much better church. He didn't say that, did he? He said, you overcome right there. You stay there and as far as you're concerned, one of the most strong appeals he makes to an individual within the church is in the last letter to Laodicea, where he tells the whole church that he wants to spew them out of his mouth. You make me sick. But he says, I'm standing and knocking at the door. It's not the door of the heart, it's the door of the church. And he says, if just one member wants me back in, I'll come in. What a promise. One member can get Jesus back into a church. That doesn't, of course, give the whole church fellowship with Jesus, but he says, I will sup with that member and they will sup with me. We'll have fellowship together. That's the most misapplied, misunderstood verse in the whole Bible. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. It has nothing to do with conversion. It has nothing to do with counseling and inquirer. It has everything to do with a church that has lost Jesus and any member in that church can get him back in. So you see, each letter has the same pattern. But it's most helpful to read the letters side by side. We read them one after another in the Bible, but when you put them side by side, you see some very different things appearing in the letter. I've, I've colored what is the same. And you notice straight away that one, two, three, four, five are approved for being good churches, but two, there's nothing good in them. And funnily enough, they are the most successful churches of all seven. They're the most packed, they have the biggest offerings, the biggest congregations, the biggest collections, and yet Jesus has nothing good. You see, when Jesus looks at a church, he doesn't look at it the way we do. And then you notice accusation, one, two, three, four, five, two of them, nothing wrong. Well, now, they can't have been perfect, but they were suffering for Jesus, and Jesus doesn't criticize a suffering church. He encourages them. Well, now, that's just a very quick uh, survey. Uh, I wonder if I should show you one or two photographs very quickly. There's the main street in Ephesus, which was the heart of it all. I'm going to show you very quickly the pictures that we have of the different places. That's Laodicea, and on the other side, oh, we've got all seven churches on the other side there. But uh, let's just show you quickly. We've got Philadelphia, that's the remains of a Christian church in Philadelphia. And there we've got Sardis, 
great big temple of Diana here and a little brick church at the side of it where the Christians later worshipped. We've got Smyrna, the marketplace, and you can look at all these afterwards. There's the famous theatre in Ephesus where Paul nearly had a, a riot, well did cause a riot. There's Thyatira and finally Pergamum and it was on top here that we had this Temple of Zeus, the residence of Satan. Well, that's just given you a little flavour. I want now to give you a, an outline of the whole book of Revelation so that we've got an overall picture of it. It's concerned with the heavenly Christ and the earthly churches. And therefore, Revelation constantly moves from earth to heaven and heaven back to earth. It's just constantly changing scene. That throws us a little because we're not used to history of heaven as well as earth. Because what goes on up in heaven often changes things down here. Now, I've divided the book of Revelation into four groups, four sections. Two of them in red, two of them in green, because the red ones are bad news and the green ones are good news. Chapters, chapter 1 gives us the picture of the heavenly Christ and his concern for the earthly churches. Chapters 2 to 3 I've called, Things are not all right on earth. And Jesus has to correct these things. They live in a corrupted world in that part of uh, Asia and a compromised church, compromised in its beliefs and compromised in its behaviour. Idolatry and immorality have crept in, other things are happening. Those are the two major problems, even within the church. The next section, four to five, tells us things are all right in heaven. Whatever's happening down here, God's still on the throne. He's at peace, the great white throne is there and the glassy sea in front of it and the emerald rainbow around it tell you everything's all right in heaven. God is not struggling with Satan, we are, but he's not. Satan even has to ask his permission before he can do anything down here. So things are all right in heaven, God is on the throne, chapter 4, and Jesus is in charge, chapter 5. He breaks the seals on the scroll. So all of history is in God's hands and the end of history is in Jesus' hands. So the difference between things that are not all right on earth and things all right in heaven open up the book. Then we get to this very difficult section which we'll spend quite a bit of time on, bad news and I've labelled it, things will get much worse before they get better. That's the bad news. And they will get worse for the world and for the church. The world is going to suffer war, bloodshed, famine and disease, natural disasters and many, many deaths up to a quarter of the human race. The church is going to go through big trouble, three and a half years, an unholy trinity of Satan, Antichrist and the false prophet will be ruling the world at the end and under that unholy trinity the church will really suffer. It will also suffer from the city of Babylon which is portrayed as a filthy prostitute, a scarlet woman riding the dragon and again there will be many deaths, many martyrs. Indeed the Greek word martyr which originally meant witness in the book of Revelation becomes martyr and uh, the way to witness for Christ is to die for him. I might call the book of Revelation a manual for martyrdom. Things will get much worse before they get better, but only briefly. And then things will get much better after they get worse, chapters 19 to 22. Finish with the good news. What changes the situation is the return of Christ to earth and what's called the first resurrection, which we'll explain later, the reign of Christ on earth for a thousand years, then the day of judgment when the rest of the human race are raised from the dead for judgment, the second death, the lake of fire, a new heaven and new earth, and new Jerusalem. Now I hope that gives you a feel, it's a kind of four-level sandwich, good news, sorry, bad news, good news, 
bad news, good news. The bad news about the church in the present, its state is not ready for suffering. If a church is compromised already, it won't stand when the pressure's on. Holiness is the essential prerequisite for suffering. Otherwise you'll be caught out. But things are all right in heaven. Get a, a vision of God on the throne and Jesus with a scroll, sealed scroll in his hand, and you realize things are under control. God hasn't lost control at all of the situation. But things are going to be allowed by God to get much worse before they get better, both for the world and for the church. But after that big trouble, things will get much better after they get worse. And we need to look beyond the immediate future to the ultimate future to have our hope as an anchor to our souls. Well, I want in the last few minutes I've got to say that behind all this there is a philosophy of history. Now, many people are frightened by the word philosophy, but it means simply the way you think about things. And there are many philosophies of history in the world today that are clamoring for your attention on the TV, in the press, through all the media. Different philosophies of history are banging at the door of your mind. The most common one is what we call the cyclic philosophy of history. History repeats itself. It just goes on. Then there is the continuous view of history that it just goes on up and down. It never goes backwards. It's moving forwards, but we have our ups and downs, boom and bust, inflation and deflation and so on. There is the progressive view of history. As one English prime minister in 1900 said, up and up and up and on and on and on. Progress was the great key word at the beginning of this century. That's better than back to basics. But anyway, um, the regressive view of history is much more common now, which is that everything's going down the drain, the doom and gloom. It's getting worse and worse and worse. In fact, the key word as we go into the next century is not progress, but survival. But the apocalyptic view of history is the Bible view that in the immediate future things will get worse, but in the ultimate future they will get suddenly better and will stay better. Now that view of history like that is unique to three groups of people, Jews, Christians and communists, and they all believe the same thing. The only difference tr between them is what's going to change that. The communists say, well, man will change by revolution. The struggle between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie will come to a head. There'll be a revolution and we'll have the classless, crimeless society after that. But communists are now getting disillusioned. The Jews say God must change this. The Christians say it will change when Jesus comes back to planet Earth. Things will get worse until Jesus gets back and he will make them better and keep them better after that. So here we have a philosophy of history based on the book of Revelation. Jews, Christians and communists all got it from the same place from the Hebrew prophets. But that is the Christian view of history. The immediate future, worse. Suddenly, the ultimate future, much better. And the change will come when Jesus gets back. When the Lord writes history, he writes it quite differently from anybody else. And I've done this in a little diagram to try and explain. When uh, human beings write history, they cover all that is past, 
right up till now and they cover what happens down here on earth and that circle represents human history but it's only partial, it's only part of the story. History is his story and when the Lord writes history he gives us the whole picture not just what is past up till now but what is future and will happen then. Not just what happens down here on earth but what happens up there in heaven and so we have this total picture of history. Not just the past but the future and not just earth plus heaven. Now that's why the book of Revelation goes into the future and goes up to heaven to look into the future. So we're constantly up in heaven, down on earth, up in heaven, down on earth. And what happens up there affects down here. For example, when Satan is finally thrown out of heaven in chapter 12 of the book of Revelation, he comes down to earth frustrated and angry, full of fury to vent his worst down here. And that's when Antichrist and false prophet appear. So normal historians don't realize that what happens up in heaven is all part of the picture and what happens in the future gives light to the past and we get the whole total history from the book of Revelation. We call this apocalyptic history. The word apocalypsis in Greek means unveiling, to draw a veil away, to draw a curtain away and the two curtains that are drawn away in the book of Revelation are the curtain that hides heaven from us and the curtain that hides the future from us and until those two curtains are removed we cannot possibly get the total picture. So God unveils the future and he unveils what's happening in heaven so that we get the total understanding uh, of his history, his story. Now moving on from there, just to give a very brief overview of chapters 4 and 5, chapter 4 I would entitle The Creator and His Creatures and it's a magnificent scene, it beggars description. This beautiful rainbow, white throne, glassy sea and some rather weird creatures, four of them representing all God's creatures are praising God and worshipping him. From chapters 4 and 5 we get a tremendous number of choruses and songs and hymns which we use in worship because they're just full of worship. The book of Revelation is not only full of art, it is full of music as well, full of singing, full of songs, songs of praise. So in chapter 4 John is invited to come up to heaven. Though his body is still in prison on Patmos, his spirit is up in heaven seeing heaven itself and seeing the beauty, the colour and above all the security of it, the peace of it. God is sitting on his throne. Little girl went home from Sunday school with a new chorus she'd learned, God is still on the phone, she sang all the way home. Well, it's a nice thought and it's true but the truth of Revelation 4 is God is still on the throne. God has not surrendered any of his sovereignty to anyone. He is still in total control of Satan himself and of everything that goes on. Nothing can happen without God's permission. He is on the throne. History is not out of control. You might think so reading your newspaper, but read Revelation 4 and you know that God is still there. He is sovereign. Everything is happening according to his plan or according to his permission. Could be either. Well now that's the picture in chapter 4. There are 24 elders and that figure is significant throughout the book of Revelation. Whenever you see 24 elders or 24 this or 24 that, we're looking at the representation of 12 tribes of Israel and 12 apostles of Jesus. They make up the 24 key figures, 12 sons of Jacob or Israel and the 12 apostles make up this whole dispensation of God's amazing plan for our redemption. So we'll find in the New Jerusalem there are the names of 12 apostles and 12 tribes on the New Jerusalem signifying that the future of the Jewish people and the Christian people are one. We shall be one flock under one shepherd. But here we have the old people of God and the new people of God represented always by 24 in heaven. In chapter 5 John bursts into tears and he weeps because God 
tells him that he, God, will not bring history to an end. He wants a man to do that for him. He wants the end of human history to come about in human hands. And he can't find a man who is worthy to start the countdown of history. And John weeps because no human being is considered worthy by God to bring history to an end on God's behalf. And then he sees this combination of a lion and a... No, not a lamb. A ram. A ram. I wish I could go through everybody's Bible and cross out the word lamb and put the word ram because the word lamb to us means a little white cuddly thing. And I've seen so many uh, pictures of the Lamb of God and in churches and I cringe when I see this little white cuddly thing a few weeks old. Listen, the Passover lamb was a ram one year old and here we have a lamb, a ram with seven horns in its maturity. It's a strong picture. It's not a weak little picture like a little lamb. It's a strong picture. You wouldn't like to be shut up in a room with a seven-horned ram one year old. You would not think of cuddling it. You'd be measuring your distance to the door. And the lion and the ram are very strong pictures. Nevertheless, the ram has obviously been slaughtered and yet is alive. The, the ram looks as if it has been slain. It's Jesus, of course. He is again represented by the lion of Judah and the ram that takes away the sins of the world. And this man and this man alone is considered worthy to start the countdown of history. I'm not worried that any man's going to press the wrong button and cause a nuclear holocaust that will wipe out the human race because there's another finger already on the button and it's Jesus' finger and it belongs to a pierced hand. God will not allow any man to end the human race except Jesus. He alone is worthy to receive all power and honour and glory. And now heaven is singing to Jesus because Jesus is at last going to bring to an end the whole sordid history of our human race. And it has been a sad and sordid story. And Jesus is going to bring it to an end. It's not going to go on like this forever in this planet. And many people think it will just go on and on and on like this. It won't. It's got to stop. One of the reasons why God uh, gave us a sentence of death for rebelling against him was that he would not allow any of us to spoil his universe forever. So he put a limit of years on our life precisely to stop us polluting the environment morally and materially forever. And so God has limited us, but he has also set a limit to the history of the whole human race. It will come to an end, and yet the end will be a beginning. Now those are chapters 4 and 5, but now we come to chapters 6 to 16, the heart of the book of Revelation, and the worst part. Uh, it's bad news. I love the honesty of Jesus. He was always honest with us. You know, I've heard testimonies say, I came to Jesus and all my troubles were over. Have you ever heard a testimony like that? I used to believe them. I don't know. My testimony is just the opposite. I came to Jesus in 1947 and my troubles began. Got baptized in the Spirit a few years later and my troubles got worse. And I've been in more trouble in the last 10 years than in the previous 30. <laughs> and some of you know that. But cheer up, says Jesus. He promised us trouble, so my life has fulfilled his promise. And he told us that there's going to be big trouble, great tribulation. Paul did the same. He told his converts, through great tribulation you will enter the kingdom. We should be honest when we're leading people to Christ. You're heading for trouble. You will now become a social misfit. You will become a stranger, a pilgrim, a sojourner passing through. You will no longer belong to the world into which you were born. You are now part of a new human race. You're no longer homo sapiens, you're homo novus. That's Latin for new man. Because in Christ there is a new creation, you're a new human race and you don't fit in this evil world anymore. Present evil age will not like you. 
It's the quickest way to be unpopular, to follow Jesus. In fact, he said he cursed anybody when all men speak well of you, which is quite a thought. Trouble. In the immediate future, we're in for trouble and big trouble. And here's a bit of good news for you. Nothing worse will happen to you than is described in chapter 6 to 16 of Revelation. <laughs> Jesus has told us the worst. You laughed at that, but it's good news, you know. What is better, to have the doctor tell you the worst or to have the doctor not tell you anything? Which would you rather? We want to know the worst. Then we can adjust to it. We can get ready for it. Well, Jesus was honest enough to say to these seven churches and through them to us, things are going to get bad, very bad, towards the end of this age. And so in chapter 6 to 16, we have a series of troubles which together constitute what we call the big trouble or the great tribulation. And they come in three series of sevens. There are seven seals, then seven trumpets, then seven bowls. Without at the moment asking how they relate to each other, let's just run through them so we know what they are. And we notice straight away that the seven seals, each seven divides into four, two and one. The four belong together, the two belong together and the one stands on its own. We notice also that the seventh in each case is a worldwide earthquake, is exactly the same, but the six are different. Now let's just take the first four seals, for example. There are four horses. Common sense tells you these are not real horses, these are pictures, symbols. And the symbolism is in their color, white, red, black and green. But we are also told what those colors mean. White is a symbol of military aggression. Napoleon rode a white horse. Most military conquerors have ridden white horses. Military aggression. The red horse is the symbol of blood. Military aggression inevitably leads to bloodshed. What does bloodshed lead to? The black horse that we're told is the color of famine. In fact, human flesh tends to go that color when in malnutrition. Black is the color of famine. What follows famine? The green horse, the pale green, is the color of disease, pestilence, plague. Now here we've got four horses, military aggression, bloodshed, famine, disease. They're already riding through the earth in local areas. I could name at least a dozen areas where those four horses can be seen. Military aggression has shed blood, has led to famine and disease. Well now, those four horses will ride through the earth before the end of history, though they're riding locally now. Seal 5 talks about Christians, believers, being persecuted and praying to God, how long, Lord, will this go on? How long will you allow your people to suffer and die? I don't suppose most of you know that last year over 350,000 people died for Jesus. There are more martyrs in our day than there have ever been before. People dying because they're Christians. That's going to be quite fierce towards the end. For unbelievers, the sixth seal reveals tremors in different parts of the world and terror on the part of unbelievers, an atmosphere of fear. And finally, the seventh seal, silence in heaven, but a great earthquake down here. Now that's just the seals. It seems as if these disasters intensify as we go into the trumpets and later into the bowls. They become shorter in time, but fiercer in nature. And they change from human disasters or disasters that have a human cause to natural disasters when the environment itself becomes anti-human. And so we have the first four trumpets reveal a scorched earth, a dry earth short of rain, a polluted sea, which is 
no longer able to support life, contaminated water on land, contaminated sources of drinking water, and reduced sunlight, presumably due to some change in the atmosphere. Those are natural disasters where these were caused by human factors. Here are some natural disasters. We have an insect plague as the fifth trumpet, and then a strange one, an invasion from the Orient, from the East, of a gigantic army, hundreds of thousands of soldiers, coming from the direction of China into the Middle East. And then finally, Trumpet 7 announces the arrival of the Kingdom of God, when the kingdoms of the world become the kingdoms of our Christ and of his God. And accompanied by an earthquake again. Then we move into the bowls and now these seem to become even more intense with an outbreak of boils or cancers on the skin of human beings, the sea turning into blood. Well, it did that off the uh, South American west coast not long ago. Did you see the pictures? The whole Gulf Stream or whatever it's called down the west coast of Latin America went blood red, but uh, just for a short time, but it was for hundreds of miles. Well, that's going to happen to all the oceans. Blood from the springs, the springs on land turning into that kind of colour. And fourth bowl burning by the sun. Too little sun here, too much there. The fifth darkness, natural light going. And the sixth, the Battle of Armageddon. We'll come back to that in a moment. And the seventh, a universal catastrophe of great earthquake again. Now, if you try and work out the order of all these, you'll get into a muddle because it's quite complicated. I'm going to give you what I believe is the order in a moment. But in fact, to me, since Jesus was a good teacher, if he wanted us to concentrate on the order, he would have given it in, in a more simple, straightforward manner. But I believe he was not wanting us to concentrate on working out timetables and calendars and schedules. He wants us to be ready for all this. He's telling us all this so that we know the worst and we can there be, therefore not be surprised when they happen we will not be caught out. The world will be completely caught out and say, what on earth is the world coming to? That'll give us a wonderful opportunity to say it's not what the world's coming to, it's who the world's coming to. And we can tell them. But we can say we've been expecting this. Jesus told us it would happen. And he's honest and he prepared us for it. Nevertheless, it's a pretty grim list of disasters coming on the world. And we have to ask, how will Christians survive all this? How will they fare in it? But before we look at that question, I want to share with you what I believe is the order in which these things will happen, uh, because that will give you the feel of the structure or shape of the big trouble and these, cha these chapters in the middle. Bear in mind that we're only talking about three and a half years or 42 months or 1,260 days. Now there have been three suggestions as to how these seals, trumpets and bowls fit together. In the book they just come one after the other, but is that the way they will happen? Well, one view is that it will be successive. The seven seals will be followed by the seven trumpets, will be followed by the seven bowls of wrath outpoured. But that's a little too simple. It doesn't really fit. And it doesn't fit because the seven in each case is the same. By the way, did you notice on the previous chart that the last three in each case are woes, which in fact is a word for curses. But the final woe in each case is this gigantic earthquake. So number seven seems to be the same in each case. So a second possibility, which some Bible commentaries have, is that in fact they are simultaneous, that the seven seals happen at the same time as the seven trumpets, 
happen at the same time as the seven bowls. They start together and they finish together. So they're all happening at once. Again, that doesn't seem to fit. And you have to force the scripture somehow to fit either pattern. So I want to come to a third possibility, which I believe is the one that fits every hint that we have in these middle chapters, that it is both successive and simultaneous, that they start one after the other, but they do finish together. In other words, seals one to six are followed by trumpets one to six, followed by bowls one to six, and all finish at seven. Now that seems to fit as if we've got a crescendo, a speeding up of these last disasters and uh, we're in history anyway and we know it's speeding up, the acceleration of world events is all around us. So we have a successive speeded simultaneous relationship. Now that looks pretty complicated, don't worry because that's not, not why Jesus gave it to us or he'd have done it much more simply. But if you want to work out how these relate to each other, I think that is the way rather than this or this. But interestingly enough, between after six each time, you get a parenthesis, a kind of interlude, which describes what happens to believers in all this. Interesting that most of this, of course, is coming on the whole world and all will suffer from this. But there are interludes which describe what's going to happen to God's people. The first interlude is chapter 7, which comes after the sixth seal. The second interlude is chapters 10 and 11, which come after the sixth trumpet. And the third interval is chapters 12 and 13, which don't come after the sixth bowl because there isn't room for them there, so they come in front here. And that's roughly the outline of 6 to 16. Six seals, interval chapter 7. Six trumpets, interval chapters 10 to 11. Then the third interval, chapters 12 and 13, and six bowls leading right into this seventh climax which includes so much, the big earthquake, but it includes Armageddon, it includes the kingdom coming, everything happens here. Again, don't let the complex order worry you because uh, that's not the point of it. The point is Jesus is giving us a feel of all these things that are going to happen so that we're ready for the big trouble if it happens in our lifetime. I'm also going to say this, that these big troubles are all casting their shadows ahead of them and have been for 2,000 years. As John says in his letter, the Antichrist must come, but there are already many Antichrists in the world. I'm sure you've heard the discussion as to whether Gaddafi was Antichrist or Saddam Hussein. Well, they discussed whether Napoleon was or Hitler. Well, the answer is there have been many Antichrists, but there's a big one coming. Similarly, there will be one big false prophet at the end, but there are already many false prophets in the world. Already the four horses, those different coloured horses, are galloping through parts of Africa and parts of Asia. So that in a sense, what happens at the end becomes a way of reading your newspaper today and seeing the shadow, the foreshadowing of these later events coming. So we are already in a sense living in the last days but the last, last days that were being talked about here uh, throw their shadow before them and we can already see things shaping up for that. For example, it talks about a cashless society in which when you reach the checkout at the supermarket, you'll have to put your hand or your forehead over the checkout because you'll have a number lasered on your f hand or forehead. That seemed like science fiction 20 years ago. Swindon is now the first town in the world to have cashless shopping and shopping with a number. It's happened in our country. That doesn't mean that Revelation 13 is already here, but it is a foreshadowing of it. So that though we're looking ahead 
to these climactic disasters, we're already seeing on a smaller scale, on a local scale, we already see it happening. The people of China love the book of Revelation because they see in it a description of what's happening to Christians there. And in other parts of the world where there's persecution, they read this book because they can see it all happening in their local situation. We happen to be in one of the more comfortable countries of the world where we don't see too many shadows of all this. But if you read on a worldwide scale, you can see them. Well now, just a word about those interludes, about what's going to happen to believers. In chapter 7, the first interlude which comes here, you have a picture of two groups of God's people. One is Jewish, one is Christian. The Jewish are on earth. And during the big trouble, we're told that God will protect and preserve the whole Jewish nation. Because Jews have always been a scapegoat for trouble, as Christians have been. And uh, they will be protected and preserved through that big trouble. Next you see a multitude from every kindred and tribe and tongue, but up in heaven, looked after by God. And that has led some to assume that Christians will be in heaven before the big tribulation comes. I'm going to deal with that in the next talk. I don't believe it. When you read that second half of chapter 7 carefully, it clearly is made up of Christians from all over the world. They are washed in the blood of the Lamb. But what you find is they are coming out of the great tribulation and the verb coming out there means, and you must take my word for it, not coming out in a bunch, but coming out one by one, slowly, over the whole period. These are coming out, one by one, out of the big trouble. And when you ask how are they getting out of it, the answer is very simple, martyrdom. And you find this emphasis on martyrs all the way through the book of Revelation. And uh, they have been in the big trouble, they have been under the scorching sun, they have been uh, through these disasters, but it says, but now the sun is not smiting them anymore. And a lovely touch, it says, God is wiping away all tears from their eyes. Why should they be in tears if they've been caught out before the big trouble? They're in tears because they've been through it and they're coming out of it by martyrdom and it's a number that no man can number. So here's the first little interlude, it talks about Jews on earth and a huge number of Christians in heaven who are coming out one by one as martyrs. Not all Christians will be martyred, some will be able to escape and survive in country areas, not in town areas, but uh, many will be martyred. And we shall see in a moment Babylon drunk with the blood of the saints, the worldly city. Well, that's the first interlude. The second interlude is, um, it comes at the end of the sixth trumpet. And here we have an interlude about witnessing. And at this point, John, in his vision, is told to eat a scroll, a wrapped up, a rolled up piece of parchment. And he eats it and he says it was sweet and sour. You've heard that phrase somewhere before. But uh, he is now, you see, going to be shown the worst troubles of all and he's told to digest all this in vision and as he digests it, he has this strange mixture of sweet and sour. It is sweet when he first tastes it and then it turns sour. Your sweet buds are at the front of your tongue and your sour buds are at the back of your tongue. And sweet and sour pork pleases your whole tongue. You get the sweet at the front and the sour at the back and uh, John says, that's what I feel like when I'm chewing through this bit. And in fact, that's my reaction when I read the whole of Reve Revelation. It's sweet at first taste that Jesus is going to win. And then you begin to think of all that's got to happen before he wins. And it turns sour, the back of your throat. It's a vivid picture of John's reaction to what he was having to digest himself in all this. And uh, I think it's a very similar reaction I have to Revelation. It's sweet and sour. It's sweet, it's good news, and yet it's sour. It's bad news. Bad news before the good news. 
And then in chapter 11, right at the end of history, we're told there will be two witnesses in Jerusalem and they will be killed for what they're saying and their bodies will be left in the street, God's last two witnesses. And then after three days, they will stand up and come to life and people will see them ascend to heaven as if what happened to Jesus will happen to them. Who are they? I don't know. I'll tell you when they come, if I'm still around. Speculation about their identity is misplaced. Then we have the final interlude when things get really tough for believers on earth because the government of the world will be in the hands of this unholy trinity. Instead of Father, Son and Holy Spirit, we have Satan, Antichrist and false prophet. And they are the unholy trinity that will finally govern our world. And then it will get very tough indeed for believers. That's when we will not be able to shop or buy food unless we are prepared to have that dreadful number 666 on our bodies to hold over the checkout at the supermarket. It's going to be very tough. The false prophet will even do miracles, satanic miracles, to bolster the regime of this dictator, this antichrist. Anti doesn't mean against, it means instead of Christ. When the devil tried to tempt Jesus, he said, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world if you'll bow down to me. And he was offering Jesus the post of Antichrist, which one day a human being will accept. Isn't it amazing if Jesus had given in to that temptation, we'd be talking today about the Lord Jesus Antichrist. But we talk about the Lord Jesus Christ because he refused the offer. But one day a man will accept it. So here we have this totalitarian regime. The world will not finish in a democracy. It will finish up in a dictatorship. And these three will be the dictators, two of them human and one superhuman, Satan. And Christians will have a very tough time. So that's the final inter interlude in chapters 13 and 14. 14 finishes with three angels and this vision compensates for the horrors. It's a foretaste of the future. It shows a huge number of saints safely in heaven and a call to fear and worship God. It says Babylon is fallen. Well, we'll talk about that in the next talk. And it finishes with a, a warning to believers, to saints, that they could finish up in hell. That it may mean martyrdom to stay faithful to Jesus. But it says this, write down, said the angel John, write down, from now on, blessed are those who die in the Lord for their deeds do follow them. That's often read at funerals, but it's really a verse about the last days when people are dying, not of natural cause, but dying for Jesus. Blessed are those who are martyrs in the last day. Now I think we just have time to look at four ways in which these middle chapters have been interpreted and quite wrongly in some cases. But when you pick up a book on the book of Revelation, you'll find it usually follows one of these four schools of interpretation. And the real nub of the question is, these disasters, when will they happen? When are these predictions fulfilled? And there are four different answers from the scholars. And I want to run through them because it complicates books about Revelation and you will come across these and you might as well know about them. They're given horrible labels and uh, the four schools of interpretation of this big trouble are the preterist, the historicist, the futurist and the idealist. And they're all answering the single question, when will these troubles happen? And the preterist says they have already happened. They are all concerned with the fall of the Roman Empire under which the seven churches of Asia lived. And therefore to us today, they are all over and done with. They are historical to us, they're in the past. They belong to the first century AD and into the second and maybe third. Babylon 
in the book of Revelation sits on seven hills. And so they say, well, that must be Rome because Rome was on seven hills. That's the preterist and it interprets the whole book in the light of the Roman Empire and therefore treats it all as past in the first centuries AD. The historicist believes this middle section covers the whole period of church history between the first and second coming of Christ and unfolds a complete church history and they love to take chapter 6 to 16 and something like the Cambridge Modern History in six volumes and lay them alongside each other and read, read off the history of the world over 2,000 years. But actually that is very difficult one. You really have to force it to fit. Against the first one most of the disasters listed in 6 to 16 never happened in the decline of the Roman Empire. So I can't believe that one. In this case you have to so to force it they tell us that we're somewhere in the middle of chapter 16 in 1997. That you know we're unfolding it all and you can read about the Reformation and the early persecution and so on. Uh, one variation of this is even to use the seven churches of Asia as seven periods in church history. And did you know that we're now in the Laodicean age? Have you ever heard that one? Well, the seven churches of Asia do not represent seven periods of history. They represent seven types of church in all ages. That's what they represent. But here I'm not convinced that there are seven ages of the church between the first and second coming of Christ and that therefore we can find out exactly what chapter of Revelation we're living in. The third way of tackling these chapters is the futurist which says all these bad disasters are still future to us. So we have this view that says they're all past and done with, this view that says we're in the middle of them and this view says they're all yet to come and that we're talking about the last seven years of this age, three and a half of which will be the big trouble. I'll tell you quite frankly that's the one I basically believe because when I read chapter 6 to 16 I just can't fit them in to what has happened already. I can't believe we're in the middle of it and I can't believe they're all over but I can believe they're all future, maybe near future but certainly future. The fourth view says they don't apply to any time, they apply to every time. They are simply myths or stories that you can apply to any age at all. They don't have any location in history or in time but they, they show us what's happening all the time in the eternal struggle between good and evil. You mustn't time any of them. This is the eternal struggle between good in heaven and evil on earth and so it goes on. Well there's an element of truth in that because as I've told you already the future disasters do cast their shadows before them and you can see the beginnings of them now in our age. So my approach is a mixture of the last two, primarily the futurist, that we're looking to the big troubles ahead of our time but that we can already see in our century these things beginning to happen. We see little dictatorships, we see little antichrists, we see little false prophets, we see the beginning of big troubles, maybe more than the beginning. Well now I just thought I'd mention those different schools of interpretation at this point because that is how different people interpret all these disasters. They either say they're all past in the Roman Empire and its fall or we're in the middle of them now, we're halfway through them or they're all future or they happen at any time. Well, primarily futurist, they are ahead of us, thank God perhaps, but uh, they will come. But already we can see these foreshadowings of these things happening now. We can see polluted oceans. We can see the sun becoming too strong or too weak. We can see the ozone layer uh, separating out. We can see so many things. We see the four horses riding through the earth. We see a greater shortage of clean water 
than food. We see all this happening and it no longer seems science fiction, it seems only too real. The scenario is becoming entirely credible. So the idealist which applies it to any century has some truth in it, but I believe the major truth is futurist. And with that we'll close this talk.